Um, so a couple notes before we get started. Um, uh, first, I wanted to welcome those of you who might be new coalition members, because I know we have a couple of new signups over the past couple weeks. Um, so if you are new to the coalition, we're very happy to have you join us. Um, I also wanted to let you guys know that this webinar is being recorded uh, and will be posted online later. Um, so after the webinar, I'll be sharing some resources and information along with the recording of the webinar, um, but wanted to let you all know that that's happening. Um, and then finally, if you have questions um, throughout the webinar, you should be able to ask them via chat um, through GoToWebinar. Um, and we'll pause a, couple, a few times throughout the process um, to answer some questions. So um, first, we're going to go through a brief agenda for what we'll be talking about today. Um, we'll do an introduction to the appropriations process for those of you who aren't as familiar with how DC works as we are, uh, and, and talk about the key times that it's important to meet with your members of Congress throughout that process. Um, we'll do an update on the federal funding for Healthy Homes programs uh, last year and then an outlook for this year. Um, and then we'll talk about in-district outreach, uh, why it's important, and how you can participate, um, and then look ahead to what we have coming up this summer. Um, so to start, I'll turn it back over to Darcy for the appropriations process. Hi, everyone. Um, the appropriations process is a fancy word for how we get money to spend on things that we care about. The federal government has a budget, and the money that is spent in that budget is decided upon by members of Congress. The president starts out at the beginning of the year uh, identifying his priorities or her priorities and presenting a budget to Congress. However, the president doesn't actually have the power of the purse. Members of Congress do. So the budget is more what we would refer to as a suggestion from the president. It talks about what he would like to see money spent on. Then as that budget arrives, the House and Senate, long ago and far away, in a time I still remember, also used to write budgets and say that they thought those were their priorities and then reconcile those budgets and pass them. Uh, in the last decade, they have really allowed the budgeting process to go by the wayside. It didn't have any authority. It didn't actually say what was getting spent. So they've just stopped writing budgets now. They go directly to the appropriations process. So there are um, specific, there's an appropriations committee on both the Senate side and the House side, and those members break up into smaller groups and have what they call subcommittees. Those subcommittee appropriation members decide how much money is going to be spent uh, on the House side, they create an appropriations bill, and on the Senate side, they create an appropriations bill. So the subcommittees get input from all their other members. So a House member would go to a subcommittee member and say, I really want this amount of money spent on. I really want this amount of money spent on. So they actually get input from other members of Congress. They also get uh, input from the public at large. They get input from lobbyists. They get input from industries. They get input from all the different entities that might be affected by government's money being spent. So those subcommittees get their uh, requests in pretty early in the year. Um, typically, the House is a little bit earlier than the Senate, but in March and April, they need to know what outside entities or what other members of Congress want them to put in their appropriations bill. Then the next part of the process is that this, the bill becomes a public document. It is released after the subcommittee has met and made the decisions about those numbers. and Everyone in the public then gets to look at that bill and see how the spending is being suggested. That once again, a number of comments happen at that point, and the committee will actually have a hearing on its spending bill that is open to the public, and there will be um, there will be people who come in and testify potentially. There will be members who ask questions of each other about what the markup is going to look like and they gather as much information and input as they can to come to agreement on their bill. Then the whole subcommittee votes on their bill and says yay or nay, and then as it goes to the full appropriations committee, there's a vote that says yay or nay. So it's usually 
very unlikely that a subcommittee or a full committee appropriations bill would not pass because they are voting amongst their own colleagues for their own bill. So when it gets to the floor, it's been pretty much, you know, had a lot of input from lots of folks across the spectrum, and it's a pretty much agreed upon process. So one of the challenges that has gone on in, the, in more recent years is not that there isn't agreement and that there isn't money that people want to spend, but it's that they need to get them all done in a certain amount of time. So what has been happening typically in the last few years is they get through with the bills that they really prioritize, like defense and um, military construction, and those bills get voted on, but then they get a little slower when it gets time to get their housing bill done or when it gets time to get their labor bill done, and those end up stalling and not being brought to the floor. So we've had in recent years a number of cycles of continuing resolutions. So on October 1st, we run out of money in the government every year, and so we have to do something to fix that. So in September, there's a scurrying around activity, and we have what is called a continuing resolution, which basically means keep spending at the level you were spending in the past. Continuing resolutions are not very controversial because they basically don't allow anything to change, but they also are pretty um, damaging to our uh, system because there are times when the amount of money we spend needs to change. We need to spend less on something and more on something else, and a continuing resolution just keeps the money capped at the level it was the year before. However, because it lacks very much pain, it has been a common placeholder that we've been using. So more money gets put uh, on the checkbook while we get through the fall, typically while we get through the election cycle. That's usually an important one. And then we get to, uh, after the election, the need to actually identify our spending costs. And so what we have done at this point, typically, is that the House appropriations members and the Senate appropriations members get together, talk to each other, agree which numbers they're going to let go through, because sometimes the House would appropriate a certain amount and the Senate appropriates a different amount. They have to come to agreement. They get a, an agreement on all their bills and how what they're going to spend, and then they put the whole thing on the floor as an omnibus, typically attaching it to a piece of legislation they know will pass, and by the end of the year, they've signed up for new spending that way. So during this cycle, the most important times are obviously getting out in front of um, the requests that happen at the beginning of the year, tracking the bill you're interested in to find out when the committee is taking it up on the floor in midsummer, and then there's a little bit less influence you really can have on continuing resolutions or the omnibus because the numbers are pretty well decided. But in the end of the year, if there's a specific number that you feel like you really want to advocate for in the omnibus, that's where you have your next opportunity. Sarah, you want to move to the next slide? Yeah. So we have areas that this coalition is very interested in, and they have um, there are specific programs, obviously, that the federal government runs and certain funding that is uh, typically guaranteed to be helpful to the issues we care about, everything from CDBG grants to um, the lead program at the CDC, the lead money spent out of HUD, um, asthma programs, et cetera. Those programs are getting paid for in subcommittees that have a bigger, fancier name, but involve the actual um, agency we care about the most. So uh, in transportation, housing, and urban development, obviously the HUD program falls under that umbrella. Uh, and interior and environment is where the EPA is. Uh, labor, housing, and human services is where we find our um, Center for Disease Control funding. So. If there are specific programs that your um, program back home is accessing, it's very important to know what larger committee is in charge of the money for that particular program. It's very effective to go in and talk to offices about a program that's having physical effect in their district and then tying it to where those funds come from. 
So we will, we will do everything we can to help you be as educated as possible about which committees are having influence in your community and why the message you're taking to your members affects the particular committee assignment. Next page. Okay, um, so I'll go over a bit of an appropriations update in terms of what's happened over the past year, um, focusing on the healthy housing programs that the National Safe and Healthy Housing Coalition has submitted requests for in the past. Um, so the big news in terms of lead poisoning prevention funding that I'm sure so many of you are aware of is the big increase we saw from 2017 to 2018 at the HUD program, um, an increase of 85 million dollars, um, and then also the increase uh, at the CDC program for lead poisoning um, from 17 to 35 million dollars last year in fiscal year 18. Um, so I'll go over, over a little bit what that looked like at each agency level um, for some context about what's happened um, in recent months. So at HUD, as I said, we've gone from 230 to two, or go straight, gone from 145 million in fiscal year 17 to 230 million in fiscal year 18, um, which was really exciting. And those of you who have worked with us at the coalition for a while um, and have been involved in healthy housing advocacy may recognize that number as one that we've advocated for for a while and, and know how important this program is. Um, this year in fiscal year 19 so far, we've seen that um, both the House and the Senate bills um, want to at least keep that number where it is um, in the House, at keeping it at 230, and it's in the Senate um, have, has proposed to increase it to $260 million. Um, so we'll see going forward um, if that increase in funding proposed by the Senate could potentially get carried forward throughout the rest of the appropriations process. Um, and here's a kind of graph showing in, in a zoom in on what that change in funding has looked like, like over the past couple of years uh, and really how significant it was that there was an increase last year. Uh, at CDC, uh, we also saw last year the increase from $17 million to $35 million, uh, which was really exciting as I'm sure many of you know that that program had been cut severely in the past and um, was nice to see it get back up to where it had been um, before 2012. And we also saw level funding for the asthma program and the tracking um, network, which was, um, well, not quite as exciting, still fortunate that those programs were able to be preserved at their um, funding levels and continue the work that they were doing. Uh, both the House and the Senate bills for all three of these programs have um, looked to keep level funding uh, at the higher level for lead and the same levels for those other two programs going forward. So that's what we're expecting to see for the rest of fiscal year 19. Um, and this illustrates, if you're not familiar with this history, the, um, what, the, what the lead program has faced at CDC and how it has now gotten back up to where it used to be. And then um, finally at the EPA, um, in terms of uh, lead, indoor air, um, and radon programs, um, we've seen that for the most part, they've stayed at level funding over the past several years, and um, the coalition has been happy about that, and in, in, in terms of requesting continuously level funding for those programs, which have sometimes in the past, by various um, proposed bills or budgets, been targeted for, um, for cuts, um, and those programs have sometimes come under scrutiny. So we've, we're happy to see this year um, level funding so far for those programs, and we'll uh, hope to continue to see those programs preserved. Um, and as you can see, that's been pretty level over the past several years. Yeah, um, so Darcy, if you could talk a bit about what was special in fiscal year 18 and, and why we're able to see those increases at yes. the CDC. Yes, um, there a news item now that seems far back in our memory was that in, um, in 2017, we were having trouble getting our budget uh, passed, our appropriations passed. There was a fight between um, both parties in Congress, and there was not agreement on what numbers should be spent on the federal budget. But the House and Senate came together and, just, and came to an agreement, and they identified 
a certain amount of money that was going to be spent in both 2018 and 2019. It was referred to as the budget deal. It was in um, no way reflective of the president's budget request and uh, brought substantially more money to the table on both the defense and the non-defense side. And because of that um, tr pot of money being larger than had been expected, appropriators were in the position to, of being able to spend money on things that they had typically been having to trim over previous years. So a significant number of things got a bump up. And one of the ones that was most notable for us was the program at HUD. And so there was a significant amount of extra money that came in. It has also been the case that this administration and um, the the agency head, Ben Carson, have talked significantly about lead, and, lead, and there does seem to be a, a sensitivity toward making sure that there is a um, uh, an image that, that this administration cares about this issue and that they're willing to spend money on it. So that meant that we got the number that had long been um, uh, lobbied for on our part, long had been asked for. We've been educating on that uh, amount of money for a number of years. And uh, Senator Reed of Rhode Island, a staunch advocate on this issue, uh, was able to um, kind of win the day on this, although the other committee chair uh, on this for this particular agency, Susan Collins, is also very um, sympathetic to this issue. And it's a, an issue in her state as well. So we were very excited to see this number. and. We then turned around and asked for more money because the reality is this is a number that we set 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we thought this would be enough. And now 10 years have passed. So we did send a, a, a letter in for the new request period asking for a higher dollar amount. And we are very um, buoyed to see that the Senate did go higher. And it will be interesting to see how that number gets conferenced between whether we'll get to see some of that extra 30,000 that the Senate wants to put, I mean, 30 million that the Senate wants to put in or whether it'll be, um, or whether the House will win the day or whether they'll split the baby. We'll have to see how that goes. But uh, the big question amongst uh, programs across the um, spectrum is what will be happening in 2020. The budget agreement only covered 2018 and 2019, and then theoretically, the um, the Budget Control Act, the caps, should be come back into place unless there's going to be another budget deal, and that remains to be seen. So we are very excited about these numbers, but we are um, cautiously optimistic, and we are in no way interested in taking our foot off the pedal and continuing to advocate for what a priority it is to be spending money in this um in across these all these programs that we know are real priorities for healthy housing issues. Um, are, are there any questions about the funding numbers um, that we've seen? As a reminder, you can submit questions, I think, through the, um, the chat function or as a question um, through GoToWebinar. So if you have questions throughout the webinar, go ahead. Um, but otherwise, we'll move on to the next section about in-district outreach. Yes, so thank you all for being on this call. I hope that being on this webinar means you have interest in learning a little bit more about doing um, outreach to your members of Congress. When we periodically have uh, opportunities to have folks fly in from around the country and have a day on the Hill where we take people to the offices to talk about the issue. And it's exciting and great when we are able to do that. However, the reality is that there's a myriad more opportunities uh, for interactions with your members and their staff back where you live. Number one, you're able to um, talk about your program, show them examples of your program, invite them to your program, uh, give them relatable experiences about what's happening with their constituents at home. Number two, it's some place that you can easily get to. So you can go to an office for your member in a town, either the town you're in or a town close to you fairly easily. That's not a three-day flight to DC, not at work, not you know doing all these other things. Um, the other a really effective aspect of the in-district outreach is you could potentially even take somebody else with you who is, can speak to the story of what is um, what is going on. 
we recently worked with some folks from Flint who came into town and um, took them to the Hill and it was a great experience, but back home they were able to talk, you know, day to day with their members and have on the ground examples and have children that they can take in and talk and um, really have effective engagement versus only having the people we bring to town. Um, I was going to go back and look. Oh, oh those questions there are not one that we need. Okay, sorry. Uh, so in-district meetings are very effective and very helpful and are a great way for you to learn more about what is going on and what is a priority to your member and a great way for them to understand what you're doing locally that is being uh, affected by the federal dollars that they are voting on spending or not spending. Next slide. So um, in DC, uh, we probably use the word lobby and education far more interchangeably than people in the rest of the world do. So the reality is, if you are going into an office to talk about how federal dollars that are coming to you through CDBG grant, through HUD grant, through you know whatever program you are accessing or working with, and talking about how it's affecting your community, that is in no way lobbying. Lobbying is very strictly um, legally identified as saying, I want you to vote for bill XYZ. This is the number of the bill. This is what I want. If you are talking about bill XYZ, you go in the office and says, this is how bill XYZ affects your constituents. This is how bill XYZ does something that's helpful. That is not lobbying. That's called education. And you are a font of knowledge and a resource for your member and your member staff about the issues that are affecting their community. And so you being there to educate them about what's happening on the ground is not lobbying and there you should have no concern about it being a conflict of interest related to the work that you're doing. Um, you can, and even with, um, with the conversation about a program that you're having access to, you know, you can explain how the CDBG grant is helping you. You can explain about how the HUD program is helping you. That doesn't mean that you have to say, you can say thank you for the new level that we're funded at, but you don't have to ask for a specific number. You just explain how it is affecting your efforts and improving the situation on the ground. Uh, National Center for Healthy Housing is a 501c3, and so it is, uh, that is a tax exempt organization and so by law they follow different rules than a for-profit corporate entity but even under 501c3 laws a certain percentage of my time as a person who works with the national center is allowed to spend be spent making a specific lobby ask so i can talk about a bill number because it's a specific amount of my time there is a cap on how much of my time i can do that i need to be doing other 501c3 things in other parts of my time, which is educating, doing webinars, talking about ways for people to engage, educating members and staff here in DC. Uh, there's a myriad of things you can do that do not cross the line of um, what would be uh, specifically called lobbying. Next slide. So we're gonna have um, Joe Miller tell a little bit of a story here about the visit that she went with uh, folks in Minnesota. Joe? Well, hello there. Um, yeah, thank you, Darcy. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we um, are really fortunate here in Minnesota. We have a lot of representation of the coalition and of the National Center for Healthy Housing. So last year, Joan Cleary, she's an NCHH board member, and the Minnesota Community Health Worker Alliance Ex Executive Director, and Jojo Liebler, I always say that wrong, Liebler, uh, she's also an NCHH board member and a production manager and producer for um, 2 by 4 Productions, who's worked with local government, the Mayo, um, and many others producing videos for training and um, advertising, etc. And then myself, at the time, NCH Senior Communication Advisor and the National uh, Safe and Healthy Housing Coalition Committee Chair and um, member, of course. So we met with uh, Chow Lee at Congresswoman Betty McCollum's office. And you saw her name early on in the slides here. Um, she's with 
obviously Minnesota, she has been the champion of education, healthcare, and infrastructure. She serves as the leader of the Interior Environment Subcommittee, and in 2016, that subcommittee appropriated about 30 million, 30 billion, excuse me, 30 billion dollars for EPA and many other organizations within the community. So um, that subcommittee is very active and obviously very important to our work. So we reached out to our office and let them know that we wanted to provide some information about the coalition, the National Safe and Healthy Housing Coalition, and how we're partnering with others around the nation and working to advocate for policies and resources that will impact Minnesota. So getting that local information was really important to us. We were able to set up an appointment with uh, Mr. Lee, and um, we took with us some materials that I'll go through in just a second. But Mr. Lee started the conversation uh, with us, and it was interesting because they had done their homework. We let them know why we were going to be there. We had sent some information ahead of time, and they did some homework in anticipation of the meeting. So we participated in a discussion about lead poisoning prevention efforts, and he had already talked to a couple of local nonprofits. He had read some um, reports from Reuters and viewed some maps that um, really showed where those hot spots are for um, both lead poisoning and asthma in Minnesota. And he also reviewed the Minnesota blood lead screening rates and he drew the conclusion that very little was being done to improve screening rates. And I'll get to that in a second too. So then Joan introduced the um, coalition and NCHH to Mr. Lee and Mr. Lee um, was a little bit familiar with the work that was being done in Minnesota and um, had become familiar with uh, NCHH and the coalition just from the information that we sent over. So, you know, as a constituent and a, you know, kind of quote unquote subject area expert, what we learned um, was that we need to connect more. Uh, we, as a national coalition, need to help our leaders, our local leaders, and those that are representing us nationally understand what it is that we're doing and how their work impacts us and our local efforts. We need to let them know that there is this national coalition of over 300 organizations who are working together. That was a surprise for them. They were absolutely thrilled. They looked at ways maybe that that could help them in some of their other efforts. So it was easy to talk about past success and the role of local nonprofits and local government agencies in the work moving forward and how that's replicated around the country. Um, and again, we were at an advantage because we were talking both about how it was going to imp imp impact us locally, but also because of Congress, the Congresswoman's position, we were able to also talk about that um, on a national level and her impact on um, making funds available. So uh, we provided a quick history of, of local coalitions and the national coalitions. We tied that work of uh, all those coalitions together with why we were there and what the national coalition is doing and what we could do together. Uh, interestingly enough, as I mentioned, we uncovered a misconception by Mr. Lee and the office and the Congresswoman's office that there was very little being done to improve screening rates. However, we were able to tell them because we had background um, that the lead grantees, their partners in the state continue to work to improve screening rates through education, incentives, and policies, and we were able to talk about those things. So we were able to clear up that misconception and acknowledge that yes, there have been some major incentives that were in place for doctors to screen children that had stopped, and we were worried about that. So that was another problem. Um, we talked about Medicaid, um, community health workers, um, and we talked about some other uh, policies around funding and, and, of course, appropriations. So we attended as a group. Now that could have been frustrating or chaotic or whatever, but we did, um, first of all, it, the, the one probably most confusing thing <laughs> about the whole thing was that it was Joan, Jojo, and Joe. So we just decided going in, we would just go by Joe. All of us would have share the same name and just to not confuse him. And um, so that was, it was a good opening for us, but it was a little bit confusing. To prepare for the meeting, we had, as I mentioned, some great information that Sarah and Darcy have put together. And it's out there for you. And I'm sure they're gonna, you know, revamp that for this year. But the, um, the state fact sheets, were incredibly helpful for us. It was really easy to get a visual in front of them that was simple, and then we could 
dive a little deeper with his questions. That was in, that was very helpful. And again, the National Center will be happy to provide you with lots of different um, information that you can take that can help with that education process. So all in all, we found that we had great reception. We were able to clear up some misconceptions. We were able to find more ways to maybe partner and communicate and to let them know that we're all here together to support her and to support the state. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. That was great. Um, so the next thing, I'll talk a little bit about how the scheduling process works um, for those of you who are interested in going on a meeting um, of your own. So the first thing is that um, we at NCDH are happy to submit the meeting request and handle the scheduling for you. Um, we've done it many, many times and are very familiar with how to reach the staff and how to get the meeting request in front of the people that, who need to see it in order to have a really effective meeting. Um, so if um, you communicate with me that you're interested in, in going to a meeting, I will um, work with you to establish what you want to talk about in the meeting um, and what your available, availability is to try and get that meeting scheduled with the appropriate staff. Um, we typically submit a meeting request about two weeks in advance. Um, it can be a little bit more flexible at the in-district level than um, when you're coming to D.C. So what we often will do is provide the office in the opening meeting request with multiple dates or times that you are available to have a meeting uh, and then let them, you know, um, look at their staff and see who will be able to meet with you during one of those times and go from there. And it's usually not a problem to get something scheduled. Um, offices are looking to meet with constituents and especially during the summer that's what they spend a lot of their time doing and um, will be flexible on, on which staff can try and meet with you. Um, we generally haven't had an issue with getting somebody in. Um, and then the meetings are usually with the staff assigned to your issue area. Um, so another, another reason that we're happy to submit the meeting request is that we can get a feel for which staff in the office might be the appropriate people for you to meet with based on um, they might be covering the part of the portfolio that includes the work that you're talking about. Um, Darcy, do you want to talk a bit about how to prepare for the meeting? Yes, uh, and it's going to segue nicely with what you were just saying, Sarah, which is uh, that you will probably be meeting with staff. So I know that a lot of people have an image of this, you know, glamorous role of the member of Congress. You have to get to talk to the member of the Congress. They're the ones who make all the decisions. It is true that the member makes the decision, but in every office, there is one member, and then there's a phalanx of staff who are gathering all the information to provide the member. So the member is definitively not an issue expert on the things that you care about in healthy housing. However, there's a staffer who's assigned to know as much as possible about that issue, and that's the person you want the relationship with. You would like to create an environment where that staff person thinks, oh, I have such an important question about um, healthy housing in, for our district, and I just, who should I call? Oh, right, I know who to call. I can call Joe Miller because she came with all of her Joe friends and visited, and they have all kinds of good fact sheets. I'm gonna reach out to her and find out what I need to know. And that staffer is acting on behest of the member. So I want to reinforce that meeting with the staffer is a vitally important thing to do and do not feel um, slighted. It's the opposite of a slight. It's where the relationship needs to be built. Um, so when you're going to a meeting, you're going to get a wide range of uh, potential outcomes. There could be some staff that you get in there and they've really worked on this issue for a while and they know it pretty darn well. Having gone with the Flint folks to visit the Stabenow staff, you know, Debbie Stabenow's staff is pretty hip to the Flint water situation. There wasn't a lot of education needed there. However, you might meet a staffer for whom, although it's in their portfolio to have concerns about this issue, they've never really had to bother to think about it. They didn't, there wasn't, there weren't a lot of requests coming in about it. They didn't realize that there's an agency working on it in their district. It, it could be that it's a brand new experience. That's why we, when we provide you all with materials, try to get them into the member staff person's hand prior to your meeting. So you know that you are at least starting at a base where there's some understanding about why you're coming in and what you want to talk about. So uh, one of the most important things is that 
um, if you if we have identified some folks who will go from an area, you know, there might be an individual going or there might be two or three people. We try to make sure that we have a call together so that we can have a conversation about what will happen in the meeting and what to expect and and what that member does in Congress. Are they on specific committees that are important? Are they going to vote for something coming up? You know, we try to give you as much background as we can to prepare you for um, what conversation they might have. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so when you are actually arriving at the meeting, if you are going with more than one person, make sure you all meet together beforehand outside, touch base, identify what's going to happen in your meeting. Um, you want to say, okay, this Joe is going to talk about what happens at the CDC. This Joe is going to talk about what happens at the local agency. This Joe is going to talk about what they'd like to hear the member of Congress talking about. So assign some roles, identify what the best outcomes for that meeting are, having identified them in the call that we'll have prior to. Um, and then you go in and uh, typically you want to check in with them about how much time is going to happen in the meeting. Because if it's a meeting where they think you're going to meet for 10 minutes or it's a meeting they think you're going to meet for 45 minutes, you're going to present your case in, in very different ways. So see if you can get ahead of time as you sit down, how much time do we have? It is always going to set your meeting off best if you can start out with some kind of thank you. The good news is because we've had these um, good uh, recent appropriations numbers, you can always start out, even if that member didn't vote for that appropriations bill, even if that member was a no vote, you can still say, I want to thank you for what Congress has done uh, for these um, funding areas that are so important to our programs back here at home. So the more you can start with a thank you and just set the foot off, the tone off of not adversarial, but friendly, uh, that's your best bet. So we will give you fact sheets and information and there are very specific issue areas that you are expert on in your area but you don't need to be the expert of all the things do not feel intimidated if they ask you a question about something you don't know the answer to you absolutely say we've got resources in washington dc who can help me find that answer for you and i'll get it back to you one of the best things that can happen in a meeting is they ask a question of you that you need to follow up to give them a response on because that follow-up continues to build the relationship and continues to um, create an environment where you're a resource for the office. You want to create a relationship where they say, oh, I know who to call. They came to my office a few weeks ago, a few months ago. Um, it is very important that you talk about how your program or your work is affecting constituents. Your story is what will bring home the um, importance of what the program is doing at home. We've got lots of fact sheets. We've got lots of, you know, great grids of important numbers, and we're happy to give them all of those things. But the reality is that a specific story about what's happening on the ground is going to make a much more profound effect to that staff person who's going to then need to take this back to the member of Congress. So once again, you identify the story that's going to be the most compelling about how those funds are helping at home, and then make sure that you are able to tie it back to the funding that has made it happen, and then uh, make sure that you leave with as many questions of theirs answered and as many questions as you need to bring back to us for us to help answer if they ask something outside of your technical expertise. We also would like to really reinforce that after you leave the meeting, you need to write down what happened. It is amazing how many people in a meeting, first of all, multiple people in a meeting hear different things. So you'll be surprised if you see one person's notes about the meeting is not the same as another person's notes about the meeting. And a few days after that meeting, the specific question they asked or the specific request they had is going to start to fade and fuzz. So the sooner you get onto paper um, a note to yourself, about what happened in the meeting, the, the more clarity you'll have about how to respond and follow up and provide uh, more, more um, feedback. Uh, we also would like to reinforce that folks should send a um, thank you note afterwards. So, you know, a thank you email. Once again, maybe attaching the document that you wanted to make sure they had, maybe uh, a, with a response that you got about a particular question they had, but make sure that you have your own report back, 
that we can um, talk to you about, but also that you send a thank you to the staff person that you met with because they that email connection then reinforces the long-term relationship that you're going to be as a resource. Sarah, do you want to turn the page? Yeah. So in telling stories, it can be a little bit challenging to wander away, you know, too much from the main topic. So it doesn't hurt to kind of outline in your own head before you go to the meeting what how your story is going to look. So identifying um, kind of what the enemy is, what the health hazard is that is um, that is going to be the the villain in this story, uh, and then identifying ways to talk about it that have that that um, express the threat it is to your family, community, or state, um, and then how the federal program that you're engaging with, or state level program, or you know they all get resources from a variety of different um, federal uh, pipelines as well. Uh, or even local program is doing to have impact on your family or where there are still needs, where where we need to, to shore it up. Um, and then how the the continued funding on those particular in those particular areas will continue to um, make the community as a whole healthier. And um, so making sure that as you think about your story, you kind of make these points uh, linearly so that you know it's going to have an effect. Um, it's good to have a little bit of a practice there. Um, next slide, Sarah. So once again, you need to identify your villain, your problem, your challenge, identify what's coming in from the, from the federal government that's helping solve the problem, and then how that is in, encouraging and having a positive effect on the community over the long run. Next slide. So we definitely wanted to make sure that um, when you're when you've identified how much time you have in your meeting, that you talk about or think about what it is you want to say, how you're going to tell the story, what point you're going to make, what ask you have, but also think about um, but also think about leaving time for them to follow up with you. So if they tell you you've got 15 minutes, you want to identify 10 minutes of things you're going to talk about to make sure that they've got five minutes to have feedback and conversation with you. We don't want to uh, absorb the entire time with a, um, you know, with somebody at a podium. It is meant to be a conversation, not just a lecture. Uh, we also want to make sure that, you know, in these meetings, especially when they're uh, with local staff, there can be a little bit of a tendency to get a little, um, down in the weeds about, oh, you went to University of Illinois? I went to University of Illinois. And it's good to make connections. It's good to connect and show that you're part of the community. But don't let the um, the glad-handing community conversation keep you from talking about the things that you got, that you came to talk about. I've, I've seen a member of Congress have a conversation about barbecue that took the entire meeting time up about which is their favorite barbecue. And then that's not what you came to spend your time doing. So go ahead and make sure you make a connection. If you both went, if you're both Illini, yay, but make sure you also get to the point of the conversation that you came for. Next slide. Oh, so we're looking at meetings this summer because this is the time when um, Members and staff expect to see constituents. Sarah mentioned it earlier. There's more flexibility. There's usually typically more flexibility for you all as well. Um, if there are members that we are hoping to see, recess happens in, in August. And so it's a time that we, there's a chance to, you know, there's oftentimes meetings where they'll have you come in, say hi to the member, and then go have the meeting with the staff person for 15 or 20 minutes. And the member's just kind of like a photo op and you say hi and they know that you were there. But members are around more. And also, if you have interest in, as a follow-up from your meeting, inviting the member to come to your facilities or come to a, a particular home or come to some example of your program, they're around in the summer to do that kind of photo op. And so it's a prime time for having those conversations. It's also the case that um, 
you know, we're still in the process of getting 2019 ironed out, and there's still an opportunity to, to talk supportively about the numbers that are in the House and the Senate and how you'd like it to, to be reconciled in the Senate's direction. That's still a talking point that's available while those numbers remain not um, fully reconciled. Um, Thanks. So next ahead. we're going to do a bit of a poll. So this is going to get um, interactive. I hope you're all still listening. Um, so I'll launch a poll asking if you're interested in participating in an in district meeting this summer. Um, and the options are yes, um, maybe depending on scheduling or other concerns, or not at all. Um, so uh, you should all be seeing the poll on your screen. Um, and once just about everybody is voted, we'll move on. Um, but if you answer in one of those first two categories, um, that'll be our cue to reach back out to you um, and start scheduling uh, a meeting and, and talking about what you'd want to go talk about it and what would be a priority for you in those meetings over the next several weeks. And while we're doing that, also, um, if anybody has questions, once again, at this next segment, please go ahead and type anything you have in the question box and we'd be happy to answer questions that, that folks might have. Well, I know that um, I know that we have uh, by identifying some of those committees for you all, uh, giving you a sense of some of the places that are priorities for us. So we will also be looking through our membership list to identify where we have folks in areas that could potentially go meet with offices of uh, chairs of those committees. And so we are going to specifically reach out and say, you know, hey, can we find a few of you? in this area to go visit um, this important member and uh, help queue it up that way as well. And also don't feel shy about saying, I would be interested or, you know, in the maybe or other concerns, but I really don't feel comfortable going by myself because we can then work um, to make sure that we identify some partners so that you are, so that you feel like you've got a partner to, to do this if it's something new for you and you feel um, like it's, less than your highest comfort level. Uh, absolutely. I was also going to emphasize that again, um, Darcy, and that sometimes it might be the case that you, someone feels like they have part of the piece of a puzzle to tell a compelling story or to do a good meeting, but would like someone else to go with them who can provide the other side. Like if, if you have are doing program work that's really important to the community, but think that maybe there's someone else who could be um, provide a different issue expertise or something, um, that's the, the kind of thing we can listen to as well and maybe try and connect you with someone else in your area um, who could go along to a meeting with you as well. So I'll go ahead and close the poll. Um, so thank you to those of you who participated. We got a majority of everyone participating, which I think is good. Um, so again, we'll be reaching back out to those of you who expressed interest um, and start working through that process. Uh, does anyone have any questions about what that process looks like? Okay. Um, so there's one question. Um, I'll, I'll read out the questions for the whole group and then we'll, we'll talk about some of them. So um, there's one question about um, whether you have to um, join the coalition right away, or if, um, if you're starting out um, in the beginning stage um, of working on this issue, um, kind of what the first steps are to help out. Um, so I guess the, the first answer is that you don't have to be a member of the coalition or a, a long time, um, you know, participant in this, in this issue or in this area or, um, you know, acquainted with, um, with the kind of the groups that we're representing here to be doing this work. Um, we're happy to, to um, provide advice and help to anyone who's interested in doing any kind of member engagement, sort of regardless of your history with either the coalition or with this particular issue area. Um, Darcy, do you have any other advice for people who are um, starting out with the in the kind of the beginning stages of working in this area? Um, I think that what you would want to do is um, emphasize how you're learning about the issue too. 
there's no reason, like I said, there's no reason that you need to go in as such, um, you know, as, as the issue expert of all the things. If you say, um, I'm starting to work in this area and I know it has a lot of impact in our state and our community and I really wanted to talk to you about this, you know, you could absolutely set it up as, I'm here to learn from you, staff person, about what your member thinks about this, what my member of Congress thinks about this issue, and what kind of information I can gather to help him or her understand this better. We have a great national coalition. They've got a lot of materials. And if my, and if, and if my Congress member wants to know more about the statistics in this state, I can get those for it. Does my congressman want to know more about what's being done by particular local agencies in this community? I can find that out for you. You know, you can provide yourself as a resource without having to be an issue expert. You are connecting them with information that they want, and you are the connective tissue. You don't have to be the expert. I'm not Dave Jacobs, I can guarantee you. I'm just the person who brings Dave Jacobs to their feet. So that is a role that you're playing as a facilitator to get information into their hands. Do you want to answer this hey. next question, Sarah? Yeah, go ahead. Hi. So um, we had someone else who was asking about um, interning at a, at a project um, and interested in participating in an in-district meeting, but he's actually from a different state because he is in a place now, I assume, where he's going to college versus where he, um, where he is uh, a registered voter. There's absolutely nothing wrong with going to visit a member that is not the member that you vote for. You're there to talk about what's happening in the community that that member represents. The work that's being done by your organization in that community is what you're there to talk about. They actually really, I mean, I don't want to be unkind, they don't necessarily care whether you vote for that member or not. You're there to provide information about what's happening in the community about the program. So you do not need to feel in any way um, like you have to be a, a constituent. I do know that this person who's asked the question is actually from Rhode Island, and we got a great team of folks in this coalition from Rhode Island. So we can also make sure to help hook you up with somebody who is a constituent potentially so that you have that base covered as you do the meetings to make sure that you feel like you're as Rhode Islandy as you need to be. Yes, definitely. Um, okay, uh, if there are no other questions, um, we can kind of hang around for a couple more minutes um, if, if anyone's have, submitting any last at last minute inquiries, um, but otherwise that's the end of our agenda. Um, and I uh, hope that all of you found it really interesting and are now very engaged and excited to go meet with your members of Congress, because um, we're really hoping and looking forward to getting some um, good engagement and good meetings out of this summer. Um, and as I that at the beginning, I think um, we've recorded this session, so I will be doing a follow-up email to coalition members and those of you who attended uh, the webinar about um, follow-up resources, um, some of which we linked to throughout the process of the webinar um, and you know, with the recording um, if you wanted to revisit anything that we talked about. Um, and for those of you who expressed an interest in meeting with a member of Congress, we will be in touch soon. And also, um, Sarah will be including in that email contact information for both she and me, so that if you have any questions you either A, thought of after, oh, there you go, we got it on the screen, A, you thought of after we hung up and you forgot to ask, or B, you just wanted to ask one-on-one, -on -one, we're more than happy to answer any kind of questions you have about how this process works or what you need, um, what you'll need to move forward and uh, be able to take those meetings, and we're more than happy to help. Absolutely. Um, the coalition is here as a resource for those of you who are already members, who are new members, or who are not currently members as well. Um, so feel free to reach out um, with any questions.